Thank you, Alicia. Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, um, wherever you join us uh, today. Um, I'm very excited to present to you today the findings of the of the global wind energy market in, in 2018. Um, besides myself, um, there are um, also my colleagues here online. That I would uh, shortly like to introduce. Um, there's Feng Xiao, our strategy director. There's Joyce Lee, our policy and operation director, and Ra Ramon Fiestas, our chairman of the Latin America Committee. And um, also, I would like to welcome Alberto um, to this webinar. Alberto is joining us from Inge Tiam, and um, I'm very thankful that Inge Tiam is uh, here today, that Alberto from Inge Tiam is here today. Alberto um, will uh, say a couple words um, for introduction, and Inge Tiam has been a great sponsor to, to this report, and um, again, I would like, to, uh, would like to thank them for that. Um, with that, um, I would like to uh, hand over to you, Alberto. Hi, hello, thank you. As, as, as you were mentioning um, here from Mingetin, we are very proud of uh, sponsoring yet another year the uh, GWEC um, annual report for WIND. Um, because we, we believe that right now um, wind energy is uh, um, taking its part into the energy transition that we are seeing in the in the in the in the in a global scope. Okay. Well, and we believe so because we've seen that in a lot of uh, hints that the market is giving us, which uh, most of them are um, reflected, and we can see those uh, in the data that you can that you can check in the report from GWEC. So this energy transition is based in how the business models are evolving. So. There's a lot of different business models that uh, uh, we had in the past years. So we've seen in the recent uh, years, in this case, how OEMs have changed uh, a lot into their business model, entering the services um, scope and all of them delivering not only their own brand um, services, but multi-brand uh, technology services and from a suppliers let's say electricity or energy suppliers point of view uh, we've seen the growth of uh, ppas uh, which is a different approach to feeding tariffs that we had in the past and to tenders that we have or auctions that we are having in a lot of markets so ppas are another uh, business model that uh, we see which is uh, changing the the, the the sector, and in this case, uh, supporting the energy transition. Uh, together with that, it's, um, we, seen, we, we see the, this transition into the developing markets. Um, as we can see in the um, GWEC uh, report, um, the new installations, how they are going to be distributed worldwide in terms of uh, regions. So uh, these developing markets that will increase and will grow in the following years, uh, especially 2020-2021, uh, will require for the players in those um, markets to be flexible and, of course, to be global. Flexible to be able to increase or to de derive their um, footprint into those uh, markets uh, in um, manufacturing uh, through local production which is uh, quite important in some cases just because of cost and in other ones because of policy restrictions such as a local co local content in brazil or in india in which uh, we didn't see it before but we've seen that the government is changing to a local content approach so that requires flexibility uh, for all of us in the in the sector to be able to uh, localize our activity in those developing markets um, and from a more probably technical point of view this energy transition it's um, it's going to be very very uh, related to the grid connectivity and the integration 
because renewable energies and wind in particular, it's um, getting a bigger impact into the grid. So there's um, some challenges that have to be uh, solved together with the uh, grid operators. And in this case, technology is going to be a key driver. Uh, the development has been really, really high in the past years, but it's going to increase in the following ones. And we are seeing that trend together with the hybrid projects, so including PV, wind, storage, and that requires a lot of technical knowledge as well as experience. So that's something that's also going to uh, follow the, the energy transition. Uh, together with a um, key key point into this energy transition, which is the digital transformation. So in that case, um, interconnectivity and cybersecurity are uh, must-haves that um, every wind operator and every uh, supplier and sub-supplier will need to take into consideration in order to create these high-value applications um, that this digital transformation will enable. Uh, that, of course, need to have a, a return on investment to be feasible and to be correctly accepted by the market. So that's going to enable uh, or that's going to foster this energy transition that we see in the in the in in the market and which is, as I was mentioning, uh, well described into the report. So basically, we see a positive uh, outlook in this report, which we share from Inge team and with an uh, onshore uh, installations, of course, leading the way, but with an offshore growth, which is unstoppable because it will keep increasing in, in terms of um, share of installations. And this energy transition, uh, we've been discussing that for a few years already, it's gonna be, of course, uh, go or it's gonna go hand to hand, hand by hand with the levelized cost of energy decrease, which is right now one of the main indicators of this energy transition. And we've seen in the uh, report how this levelized cost of energy has evolved in the past eight years, and that's the tendency that we are gonna see. And that's, um, uh, as, I, as I'm mentioning, that's a pretty good indicator of this energy transition that we that we mentioned that's that's basically our uh, view of the market right now from uh, inge team side which is aligned with um the 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 report that we are presenting today thank you so much alberto um, there will be questions after the presentation, so and Alberto will also be available for, for you if you have questions to him. Um, I really appreciate uh, to, to see your findings here to, and your reflections on the report from the industry, um, from an industry participant. I think now we want to uh, share with you um, a bit more about the changes that we have actually done in GVEC um, concerning market intelligence. Um, the GVEC uh, Global Wind um, Report 2018 has a new design and has a new look and feel. Um, but uh, that's not only the report, also the, the market intelligence team has grown in GVEC and uh, we would like to share with you how we are approaching market intelligence right now. It was actually Alicia. I'm sorry, I think we have some technical issues here.
Um, again, I uh, apologies from my side. There, there must be some technical issues. If you just stay, uh, stay tuned for for a couple of minutes, and we are resolving this. I'm, I'm sorry about the technical issues. Okay. Thank you. Um, I hope you can you can hear me well. Um, I want to start with you um, by sharing some highlights about the market in 2018. What has actually happened in 2018? I think in a in a nutshell, um, it's fair to say that 2018 was a good and solid year for the wind industry. When you then look at the last um, five years back from 2014 to 2018, um, we can see that the industry actually added 50 gigawatts and more each year. Um, if you combine these figures, it means that in the past five years, 270, more than 270 gigawatts were added um, as of new capacity. And I think this really shows how solid the growth is in our industry and how solid each year the new installations are um, and have been in, in, uh, in the market. Um, what you can also see and what I would like to you to point out is the share of offshore and how this is rising. Offshore wind now constitutes 8% of the new installations. So we're almost reaching double digits to the um, as a share of uh, of the total installations. If you look back in the past, it's been 1%, it's been 3%, 5%, but 8% is really a solid figure again, and uh, just shows how the uh, share of uh, of the offshore wind market um, is, a, is a stable contributor to growth for the global wind market. If we go to the next slide, This is the market in 2018, and let me start with the with the onshore market. Um, 
without uh, uh, you know much of a surprise uh, china and the us have been the largest market in in 2018 again um, also germany uh, with now contributing 5% has also been uh, in the top 3 for for quite some time um, the top 5 markets so brazil india germany us and china um, constitute almost 75% of the of the new onshore installations in 2018 um, this, for one thing, shows um, how these uh, mature and developed market contribute with, uh, with steady capacity. Um, however, I also want to um, have your attention on the other markets that continue to, to have steady growth and steady in installations. Um, we have over 33 markets that installed new capacity during 2018 and um, we see a growing share of markets that actually install 500 megawatts and more each year um, and this trend again shows how uh, how wind um, how in this case onshore wind has become a solid contributor to the energy markets around the world um, let's take a look at the offshore market if we go to the next slide The offshore market um, is, of course, not as diverse geographically as, as the onshore market. Um, however, um, we see with, uh, again, 4.5 gigawatts, that's the same figure as in 2017, um, that uh, there's steady volume in the, in the offshore market. Um, the three leading markets are China, United Kingdom, and then Germany. And China, for the first time, installed more new capacity for offshore um, than any other market. Um, we expect, especially if you look at this, um, as, at this currently 9%, the rest of the world, that going forward, um, more markets will install offshore capacity. Um, there are Asian markets, there are North American markets um, that uh, are ready to contribute to the, to the growth in offshore. Um, I also would like to highlight here an indicator of how high the market activity is in offshore. Um, 4.5 gigawatts of new installed capacity, yes, but we also saw just over 3 gigawatts, for example, of tenders and auctions in 2018. Um, and again, it shows, a, it shows a healthy activity level in the market. If you now ask me what's been different between 2017 and 2018 and how the market have, uh, have developed, um, I would like you to, uh, to take a look at this uh, so-called waterfall. Um, we can see here how the market size from 2017 differs to the market size from 2018. Um, the capacity increased in, in the Chinese onshore market. The U.S. also increased a little bit compared to 2017. Um, Mexico had a really good year, um, plus, uh, plus 500 megawatt. Um, they reached uh, just 900 megawatts. Um, and Africa, Middle East, the region Africa, Middle East, had also a really good year in 2018. They went from 600 megawatt to 900 megawatt. And I think that also shows how this market, this region, um, is continued to contribute to the global wind market. Um, we had a decrease in, in Europe. Um, I mean, uh, many of you know the, the market of new capacity in Germany halved compared to 2017. And our colleagues from uh, Wind Europe have also um, alluded about um, the reasoning for, for that market decrease. Um, another decrease uh, compared to 2017 is what we saw in, in India. In India, we have um, a lot of capacity that has been auctioned. And now the execution of this auction capacity um, has to happen. And uh, we see um, certain, um, certain delays and uh, certain procrastination. And um, compared to uh, just about uh, 4 gigawatts in 2017, um, we only saw um, 2.1 gigawatts in, in 2018. Um, the offshore market, as said, remained uh, fairly stable. Um, so this is really what's, uh, what's uh, been driving the ups and downs compared to, to 2017. If we go to the next slide. 
Um, I would like to um, talk to you about um, three um, key drivers that we identified in, in the report. And you can read in, in detail, I invite you to read in detail um, about them uh, in the report. Um, why I would like to highlight these three drivers to you is um, that um, I will show you in a couple of minutes our forecast. Um, however, um, I would like uh, to, uh, uh, to tell you that our forecast right now um, represents um, is, is the outcome of what we know. So be it government targets, be it tenders and auction programs. Um, however, we at GVEC believe um, that there are other drivers, and you see three here um, in front of you, um, that can unlock and add further volume to the market. Um, these three drivers are global drivers, um, so that means we see their impact across the globe. Um, there are, of course, several other drivers, and um, especially regional drivers and enablers, that can unlock and add further potential. Um, so let me just go quickly through them. Um, changing business model, as, uh, as Alberto um, has already mentioned, um, we've seen in 2018 um, several players in the industry expanding and broadening their capabilities and their skill set. Um, being that uh, to go in different markets, being that to you know, acquire capabilities along the value chain. Um, and this, um, what we call here changing business model is an enabler for for a new volume as it means that these um, that these companies are actually looking for for new opportunities um, to look for new opportunities is driven by by the simple fact um, that uh, revenue of uh, of old business models um, and profit margins especially of old business models um, are not as prosperous as they maybe used to be um, so there is a clear need um, to go after new opportunities. And again, this will unlock um, further volume. The second driver, um, and I think 2018 um, was, a, was a really um, a good year for that, um, was corporate sourcing or corporate PPA. Um, during 2018, I think we all learned um, that corporate sourcing and, um, and corporate PPAs um, can become a driver and can unlock further volume. Um, we are still seeing them in the North American and Northern Europe markets. Um, we see them with large corporate. And based on that, the question is now how to move the, uh, the corporate sourcing and the corporate PPAs in, in other markets and uh, also to uh, other corporates and the large corporates to unlock further volume. Um, we already see um, a lot of this um, happening, for example, in Latin America, um, bilateral agreements, uh, again, uh, corporate sourcing ideas, corporate PPA ideas um, are a, a means of driver, a, a driver of volume. Um, what, uh, what, we, uh, what we need to see, or the question is now really, um, is there anything that from a regulatory side, for example, can be done to, to help corporate PPAs um, become a driver for volume in growing and emerging markets for that matter? Um, the third one is also something that we saw in 2018, and um, that is the, um, what we call at GVEC new solutions uh, with a focus on value. I'm, I'm sure many of you have, uh, have seen articles about hybrid or co-located projects. Um, and um, these are, for example, uh, one, one type of, of newer solutions um, that we need to learn more about and need to figure out more how, then, how they can provide um, further opportunities for, for wind. Um, co-located hybrid projects are one example. There are also um, off-grid solutions, for example. There are also virtual power plants as an example. And um, there are also for, um, financial solutions, to, to name a, a fourth um, example of what this solution means. Um, again, the, 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 the key here is to understand that these solutions sort of um, look towards what is the value um, that uh, that uh, a solution with wind um, can provide to an energy market 
um, or in an energy system. If we then now go to the next slide, um, here's, uh, here's our forecast for the next five years. Um, and as I said, um, this is a forecast on based of what we know, uh, government target, auction schedules, and so on. Um, and I think it's, it's great to see um, the, the industry to grow. I mean, uh, we set uh, for ourselves sort of the, the minimum bar 55 to um, higher gigawatts each year being added. So we at GVIC expect that over 300 gigawatts of capacity will come, will become online um, until 2023. Uh, um, if we think uh, 300 gigawatt, uh, gigawatt, how much uh, is that? Um, our current installed base is 591 gigawatts, so almost 600 gigawatts. So 50% of that, what we achieved now, is coming online in the next five years with, uh, with 300 gigawatts. Um, and a set, um, this is based on what we know. If you keep the three drivers I referred to earlier in mind, um, there's even potential for, for further volume. Um, I also would like to highlight um, here the, um, the growth of offshore. Um, we do believe that offshore um, will have um, double digit uh, new uh, capacity additions over the next uh, five years. Um, and um, I think this is, uh, this is also simply due to the good economics that we continue to see in offshore and again, the high market activity. Um, with that, I would like to um, go to the next slide um, where you see the regional breakdown of, of our um, outlook, but also our so-called markets to watch. Um, GVEC has selected um, these markets to watch that you see on the right side. Um, and these markets are markets where we believe that are essential um, for, for growth. Um, and I think I would like to hand over to, uh, to my colleague Ramon um, to say a few words about the Latin American markets. Yeah. Hello, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Karin. Uh, yes, uh, definitely, Latin America is uh, one of the regions of the world that uh, will uh, boost in, in, in wind power investments in the next uh, decade. Um, well, this this year, uh, Latin America has contributed to the global figures with uh, 3.7 something like that uh, gigawatts in 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 the region uh, of which uh, more than 50 percent are coming from from the brazilian market and close to one gigawatt is, is coming from from mexico um it's uh, what we see in mexico despite the uh difficulties they are facing and now with the Regulatory change, uh, not not regulatory, with the political changes in in the country, is that still the pipeline in in Mexico is strong. Uh, it's uh, it's strong in in terms of existing um, uh, strength in the supply chain to contribute the next year and so the next the after uh, year also with with uh, I would say more than. Uh, probably more than 1,000 megawatts each year. But in terms of what could be the potential new markets, what, what we are uh, seeing is that uh, especially two, two rising countries are in, in the region now. The first one is Argentina. Argentina has contributed this year with close to 500 installed megawatts in, uh, in the country. This is a double that uh, what uh, they did in, in 2018, uh, sorry, in 2017. And um, this is also showing a, a very, uh, I would say, a very uh, strong pipeline of projects due to the um, success of the, of the regulatory structure for uh, developing uh, wind power projects in, in, in this country that is based in the, what is called the Renovar program with, uh, I would say, a very strong, a very strong support from uh, what is the security, let's say the securitization of the 
of the cash flows of the project in terms of, of having different um, security schemes for for avoiding the financial risks uh, related to the uh, electricity system flows and this is uh, for sure attracting uh, investors for for the projects that are coming from from the different uh, models i would say not only the uh, the regulatory tender model from from Canmesa, but also the the PPA market that is also uh, having some some success in, in 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 the past year, and we see that probably this is going to be stronger uh, in in the future. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you know about the recent um, intention of the Argentinian government in keeping. Uh, in keeping strong the um, the policy measures uh, regarding uh, renovar program uh, last past week was announced by, by the subsecretary of energy of renewable energies in 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 the meeting in bilbao that round four of renovar program is being packed um, with the uh, i would say the additional value of um, uh, tendering also uh, not not only uh, wind, uh, renewable energy generation but also uh, great infrastructure um, uh, facilities that would be uh, probably necessary to to integrate um, large scale renewable energies into the grid. Uh, this was one of the uh, clear bottles, uh, bottlenecks identified in this market, and uh, particularly we find this as a good way of resolving this when when it comes to the tender not only for generation but also with um, with the green infrastructure capabilities and what was not disclosed is the amount of of the of the energy that is going to be allocated in this this fourth tender but uh, what we expect is that it is not going to be less than 1000 megawatts probably 75 70 percent of which uh, is going to be um, allocated for wind power in, in in the intention is to do that in in great or large packages of over 200 megawatts uh, for, for, for project so um, if we see um, a strong investment uh, aimed in, in Argentina, for this tender, uh, probably this is going to be as well a successful one as, as the, the former tenders, uh, especially tender one and tender two, uh, of which 90% of the projects have been already financed, and over 60, over 70% of the projects are under construction or in operation. So this means that the degree of successful of, of, of these policies is really large and probably unexpected because of the current uh, economic situation of the country but as i told uh, at the beginning the the robustness of the regulatory structure of renovar is, is probably the main uh, attractive driver of of, of uh, wind power developments in, in in this country and the second market um that we see uh, probably of course not not that large as the argentinian is Colombia. Uh, Colombia is now uh, under a regulatory change process um, uh, to integrate uh, new renewable technologies into the electricity matrix, into the generation matrix. And this is uh, something that is taking uh, time to match with the, with the proper uh, regulatory scheme and probably due to the to the barriers to the market barriers that that we have uh, seen in in this market uh, in regard the uh, existing incumbents and the, the tenants of the of the large project so um probably you know that this year has been called uh, a tender for for uh, a big amount of of, of uh, new renewable um, energies, not exactly called uh, renewable energies, but um, uh, but uh, mainly focused on on new technologies uh, in order to diversify the electricity matrix of the country. This is one of the 
of the drivers of the new policy there, uh, probably the most relevant one. Uh, but the, the fact is that due to uh, certain, uh, I would say, not constraints, but, but requirements of, of the of the of the renew the, the electricity uh, regulatory commission there in 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 Colombia the the, the Craig um, the the auction could not be finally award to any projects due to lack of competitiveness in in uh, at the end of the of the process uh, the process is really strictly for for new incomers in 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 terms of um, complying um, at the different um, conditions to participate or to be pre-qualified, uh, of which probably the most relevant is the one regarding the um, grid connection rights. And because of these uh, peculiarities at the end of the auction, uh, it, was, um, it was not uh, enough uh, offer I mean, it was not 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 enough uh, the, the pricing of the distribution companies that cross with the the prices of the offers were not 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 enough, and only one of these offer was crossing, and this was making the the auction not efficient and not competitive, so the the government could not allocate any any contract in in in, in this uh, in this time. And uh, now the the rules are still under performance, and the intention of the government um, was to launch this uh, second try of the renewable energy tender before 31 of June. But recently, we heard from from the government that um, this is going to be shifted to the third quarter of this year. So uh, probably it will take a little bit more time uh, to. To refurbish the tender rules because um, what uh, we are foreseeing is that not only tender rules are going to be changed, but also some cer certain rules affecting the um, regulation of the electricity sector there. So it will probably take a little bit more time uh, to to address the, the proper uh, regulation for a successful tender here. At the end of the day, we see uh, Colombia as a market that can that can bring close to 500 megawatts each year once the market is uh, prepared with the proper rules for, for, for going for this uh, energy diversification there. And Peru is uh, also um, a market that we see uh, uh, we have in the scope to work on. We see that this year also close to 200 uh, megawatts have been uh, installed in in the country, but what we see is that there is a clear lack of a uh, uh, robust policy in order to 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 design uh, the proper tools for for a much longer uh, vision of of, of renewables energies in the country and and probably in the next year this is something that we we will work in in in, in this region in order to to mm. to try to to, to establish there a, a proper uh, regulation, and I think mm. this is this is all from from the Latin America region. Thank thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ramon, um, for sharing these insights on on Latin America. I would like to hand over now to my colleague Joyce, who's uh, sharing some insights about Southeast Asia. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Ramon. Uh, so as Karen said, Southeast Asia is one of our key regions for emerging markets for wind. It has favorable fundamentals for growth of energy demand, which is projected to rise by two thirds from 2015 to 2040. And that trend is largely driven by the region's rising populations, its annual GDP growth, which is averaging 5.3%, and increasing urbanization across several countries. And while demand is growing, there's also a regional target that's been set by ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, for 23% of the primary energy mix to be supplied by renewable sources by 2025. And that's nearly double where it is right now. So among the 10, 10 nations in ASEAN, we focused this year's outlook on four developing economies which balance government commitment to renewable energies, strong macroeconomic indicators of growth, high feasibility for wind power, and high potential for installed capacity based on their existing procurement and incentive schemes. 
That means we're looking closely at Vietnam, Thailand, the Philippines, and to a lesser extent, Indonesia, which has less capacity due to be installed in the next decade. Cumulatively, by the end of 2018, these four markets had 1.4 gigawatts of onshore wind capacity installed, and there are more than four gigawatts of new capacity due to be installed for wind by 2023. I won't delve into each of these countries in detail here because of time constraints. Uh, we do go into them in the report, so I encourage everyone to take a look. Um, but I can provide some broad trends for 2018 and the year ahead. The first trend is depleting oil and gas reserves. Uh, some of the region's biggest oil producers, such as Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam, have been unable to keep with domestic oil demand, and so they've now become net importers of oil. Combined with the subsidies that they have in place, especially in Thailand and Indonesia, the oil expenditures for these governments is seen as increasingly unsustainable, which is driving their investment into renewables. The second trend is that coal does remain dominant. Under a business as usual scenario, coal use will expand in the future, and it won't change markedly from its current 20 to 40% of the energy mix that we see in these four markets of interest, unfortunately. Uh, for instance, coal provides one third of generation in Vietnam, and generation there is expected to increase by five times from 2015 to 2030. And this perception of coal as, as a provider of a um, reliable base load has created some policy gaps for renewables, which is in turn creating regulatory and permitting challenges. Uh, the third trend would be infrastructure as both driver and challenge. Electrification has been one of the big success stories in the region, driving demand for power and infrastructure investment. These four markets are on track to provide electricity access to at least 95% of their populations by next year. But there are also transmission challenges and grid stability that are emerging as medium term risks in the region. Uh, for instance, we've seen that a surge in volume of renewable projects in northern Luzon in the Philippines is starting to impact grid operations there. Other common challenges that we see in these four markets include bankability of PPAs as well as long term policy stability. Uh, while our markets have implemented national targets for procuring renewables, some policy variance is, is seen in the changes to feed-in tariff regimes in the last few years. So in Thailand, we've seen a contraction of local investment following the discontinuation of FITs for new wind projects, as well as a reduced wind target in the revised PDP, Power Development Plan. Um, the current FIT in Vietnam is only effective until November 2021, which has been the main driver of the rush to market for onshore developers. Pricing post-2021 is still unclear. And uh, fixed fits for wind have, have ceased in the Philippines as well, where they're moving to renewable portfolio standards. And the tariff scheme in Indonesia is now based on local cost of production. My uh, last trend is general elections. It's a big year for Southeast Asia. We just saw the general elections in Thailand happen at the end of March. No big surprises there. And um, we have one coming up in Indonesia in, in the middle of this month, as well as the midterm legislative elections in Philippines next month in May. Given the political campaigning around energy security and the discussion around cost to consumers, uh, our assessment is that there will likely be no fundamental policy changes in these countries around energy policy until the dust has settled and cabinets have formed by the latter part of the year. So with that, I will hand it back to my colleague, Karen, to uh, take us home. Thank you so much, Joyce, and uh, thank you again, Ramon. Um, I would like to hand over to uh, my colleague Feng um, to also say something about our market intelligence offering. Thank you, Karen. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Feng. Uh, I'm taking a role as the strategy director at the GWAC. Um, as Karen mentioned, uh, this year actually our global wind report is just a part of our GWAC market intelligence. Uh, in Bilbao last week, um, uh, 3rd of April, through the press conference, um, GWAC uh, launched its global wind market intelligence market. Uh, this uh, intelligence service uh, is a combination of the existing GWAC report and the data combined with the well-known FTI intelligence um, market um, product. Um, so moving forward, um, we are going to combine the two platforms, make the new one. Um, so all we're doing is try to make the uh, intelligent part bring more value to our member. Uh, there is a, a 
one agreement signed between FTI and the GY um, two weeks ago, which means moving forward, there will be no more FTI report and database. All the previous report and database will be incorporated into the current um, GWAC market intelligence plan form. So, um, from start from 2019, if we go to the next slide, please, uh, you will see um, under this plan form, we're going to offer a mix of uh, content uh, in 2019 uh, on top of the standard. GY Global Wind Market Report, we're going to uh, offer the transition, traditional uh, global wind market supply side uh, analysis to the industry. Also, we're going to covering the global offshore wind market, uh, followed by the supply chain assessment, which means we're going to look at the market um, details down to the component level as well. Uh, on top of the report, we are also offering um, a list of uh, statistics and the database. Uh, so we will are, we are have five years uh, outlook in detail uh, um, packaged in the Excel spreadsheet. And also we will present op option trends and learning and also the results uh, through the spreadsheet. Um, in the offshore wind sector, we're going to continue to offer in a detailed offshore global offshore wind um, project um, database. In the meantime, we will try to uh, coverage all the project which is under construction uh, and in the pipeline, uh, not just in the uh, established market, uh, also the, key, uh, the emerging market in Asia Pacific and the United States as well. Um, in addition, uh, we're going to offering the global wind asset owner operator uh, ranking. Um, um, also, the data that's covering uh, the service provider, no matter ISP, turbine OEMs, or self uh, self perform um, service provider, which will be covered in our database as well. Uh, the last item is more like the position paper or sort of spark notes focused on the energy transition, digitalization, and also a hybrid solution, uh, corporate PBA, that's something Karen mentioned um, during uh, her presentation. We will try to cover those uh, hot topics, uh, which is relevant um, in the wind industry and which will help the energy transition uh, in our GUI uh, market um, intelligent package. So in general, uh, if you, uh, Alicia, could you step one slide back? So in general, our market uh, intelligent target will be available to our corporate uh, members and one energy association members. Um, but we also will find a alternative solution for land members who do not see uh, Soon we'll join GWAC, but we'll make it the uh, flexible. Uh, so if you have any requests, believe that our GWAC market intelligence platform could bring value to your business, please feel free to reach me and Karen um, so we can find a solution for you. So overall, that's, uh, uh, that's the um, webinar content. Now uh, let's move on to the Q&A session. Um, where we, uh, from where I can see, we already have one question from K2 Management uh, from Michael. Thank you for question, Michael. Uh, his question is about, he wants to understand, do we have any insight on who will dominate the market for development? Which role will the OEM will play uh, as a developer? Also, today's investors are planning to acquire developers who will dominate offshore wind, the big, the typical uh, big one, such as Oster, Copenhagen infrastructure, uh, or mountain for etc. Uh, so this is about the 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 change of the uh, project development, both onshore and offshore. It's a uh, I think we saw the, the, such a change in the uh, both onshore and offshore sector uh, in the past five years. So, Karen, do you want to go ahead 
uh, yeah. on the discussion. Yes. Thank you. Yes, um, let me let me take a first shot here. Um, I think this question very well resonates with uh, with one of the three global drivers that we identified: the changing business models. Um, starting with uh, with the market for development, I think it's fair to say um, that we really feel um, the dominance of, of global developers, um, meaning developers acting um, in in several markets. Um, we will still have um, local developers, um, but uh, it's fair to say um, that we could then also can, can say to these developers they will only act in their market, for example, in Thailand or in Sweden or, or in Germany, but not will pursue business out there. Um, for the global developers, um, the companies that do development in several markets, um, this really means um, that they have a high expertise in the different market conditions um, and have also um, a high um, dependency on how markets volume go from one region or to another. Um, to um, answer the question about uh, the OEMs and uh, and the, the developers, um, and also you know we have this third group uh, coming in to uh, investors who might uh, look towards you know acquiring developers or you know um, and engaging closer with developers. Um, as said, um, this very well fits with uh, with our our key driver of, of changing business models, roles and responsibility right now in the energy transition are in flux. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, we see um, OEMs overtaking the role of developers in for certain projects, for certain markets. Um, we also see um, you know, investors collaborating maybe with an OEM directly for a project. Um, and then again, we see um, developers who, who take a more active role um, towards uh, the, um, the long-term operation of, of the project and uh, again also have close ties with, with developers. So there's, a, there's definitely a lot going on um, and a lot, uh, uh, a lot happening in that. Um, on the offshore market, um, I think the, the names you mentioned here, Michael, uh, Ørsted, CIP and uh, Vattenfall, um, definitely the, the companies to watch. Um, I would like to add here that uh, we see, for example, when we look towards the Asian market, however, also um, a, a strong involvement of, uh, of local or Asian regional players in that. Um, so, um, and here um, I, I think it's also fair to say to see um, that we see um, industrial players um, who might not have an expertise or a specification in wind, um, but who through the attractiveness of offshore wind, then actually um, act, become active in the offshore wind market. Um, again, I think uh, that's something that we uh, that we see in Asia. All right, um, thank you, Karen, for your uh, comment. Um, regarding the the roles that the turbine OEM are playing uh, in the new market environment that offers. Uh, one extra comment to you, Michael. Uh, you know, if we take a look at the global top 10 turbine OEMs, um, from what we can see, actually, uh, seven out of the top 10, they do have their own uh, wind project development arts. For example, Goodwin in China, uh, their project development team called TRN is already one of the top 10 uh, wind farm asset owner operator in the Chinese market. Uh, Evision is doing the same, not just in China. Uh, they joined, uh, they, they, they took the uh, stakeholders uh, in one of the project developer in Mexico, for example, and also here uh, in France. They have their project development teams uh, working on uh, on the global market. Uh, looking at the European turbine OEMs, you see Enercon is absolutely uh, playing a role as the project developer. Um, and SGRE, GE, uh, even MHA Vista, the, the OR are looking at um, the plan rules, uh, not just onshore and uh, offshore, for example, SGRE, GE, MHA Vista, they do own partially the project asset uh, in North Sea offshore market, Nordic Exona, and they have their um, in-house project team looking at market development in Europe and also in India. Vista, from what we know, are also looking at this direction. And even 
if you take a look at uh, the larger um, turbine suppliers in India in 2018, Suslong, uh, actually they, they, they have their own project development team, not just looking at the wind, they have the hybrid project, both wind and solar, uh, and also they have the solar project development pipeline uh, under their business as well. Um, so uh, again, from the OEM side, it's quite active actually, uh, especially when the market move from fit and tariff, uh, the traditional uh, uh, regulated market into the auctions. You know, in the merchant market, uh, there they are actually uh, a long rules. Uh, you know, uh, for turbine OEM to play at least also to to support uh, the project developer uh, to find in a new environment. Uh, in the offshore sectors, um, uh, I just want to mention that uh, it's not just the traditional player. The traditional player will continue to play um, in a worse strong position, but we do see uh, IPPs join in, for example, you take a look at Taiwan, and also we understood uh, infrastructure funds are, are very active in this sector. Um, most recently, uh, we, we saw the, the big ambitions announced uh, by the big offshore oil and gas company like Shell, Ecolo. So moving forward, uh, the, the picture in the offshore sector uh, will be a little bit more uh, comprehensive compared to what we see here in a North Sea market, where the traditional utility play a big role. Um, so uh, I hope, um, Michael, um, if you combine uh, the answer from, from Karen and I, um, you, you get the, I didn't partially answer to your question. Thank you. Um, let me see. Thank you. Um, um, I think we have an important question here about our, our setup. Um, and the question is if uh, reports are still available for, for non-members. Um, yes, especially the Global Wind Report will be available also for non-members. Um, also of the other deliverables um, that we have, um, there will be some um, um, uh, summaries available, um, but the full content um, will only be available to, to GVEC members. And as uh, Feng has said, um, we, uh, if you have any questions or want to talk to us, um, please reach out to us so that we can can figure out also a a solution. Um, I think we we are running a bit out of time. Um, I really appreciate everyone here um, joining us. Um, we have more questions here on our question box, and we will of course answer them individually right after the webinar here. Um, Again, um, one final thing, um, if we, uh, we have a little competition that I would like to highlight and invite you all to, to participate, uh, you can win a, a Lego turbine. Um, we would like you to enter our short survey um, and make your predictions of what you think the market for onshore and offshore new installations for 2019 will be. We will continue to publish sort of a consensus, an average of what we get of, of your submissions, and we will draw a winner um, towards the end of the year when we also have insights on the on the new market size, and you will receive the, the Lego turbine, which I believe is a great Christmas present. So please feel free to to enter our competition. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for for joining this webinar here today. <laughs>